uh, some of you already know that um, at the very beginning of this, uh, this would have been, gosh, very, very early March, which seems like about five years ago now to all of us. But um, I was ready to settle in for a, a nice, you know, good writing stretch because there would be absolutely no distractions and nothing else to do. But my husband, Dan Abbott, teaches at Southern Maine Community College, and he teaches architectural and engineering design technology. And one of the other programs there is the respiratory therapy program. And there was a woman there named Heather Higgins who asked him on behalf of Jeff Brown, who is the one of the chief respiratory therapists at Maine Medical Center, if they, he could uh, help him. They knew he had 3D printing technology and they were looking for some way to design a fitting that could allow more than one person on a ventilator. And uh, at the time this was not, um, we weren't sure what was gonna happen in Maine, how much of a surge we were gonna get. So anyway, within a day, Dan had a little thing, it's called a starfish, it looks like this. Um, and this is made with, not, it's not just any 3D printer, unfortunately, um, not anybody can print it, but this is a uh, surgical grade uh, resin. And uh, so what you do is the ventilator, the ventilator has these hoses and these have, it doesn't look it, but they have tapers for this particular kind of hose. Um, and so the, this plugs into the ventilator and then you have patient one, patient two, patient three, patient four. And that this is for the expiration. And then there's another one on the other side for inspiration. So the hoses go back that way. But the really, this is just, Dan says, it's just a plumbing fit. Everybody thinks he's some kind of genius, but this really is just a plumbing fitting. The part that's genius is that the end of the uh, hose, it's how the respiratory therapist figured out a way to um, set it up so that all four patients, even if they had different levels of lung compromise, could still be on the same ventilator. So you're not giving everyone the same amount of air, which would be unusual that everybody would need exactly the same amount. So he was printing these like crazy. We turned his um, second floor of the Ross Technology Building over there, which is where his office is. We turned it into a little factory, really. I was the only worker, but um, there was one day we worked like I don't know, nine hours, and I was about to get on a chair and go all Norma Ray on him, but I thought, you know, it's a, it's a good cause. So anyway, that's what I was doing for about a month, and now we have 320 of these, all bagged and sanitized. Uh, they've gone through an autoclave, which also was another department, the marine biology department at SMCC had an, an autoclave as a, uh, like a steam sterilizer. Uh, that you use for medical equipment. And um, so that's what we're doing. And then he started printing uh, just the garden variety Y plugs, which is basically, you know, one of these minus this and this. It's just a, a Y plug, which you can buy anywhere. But they were afraid of dwindling supplies of that, like everything else, because there were so many ventilators being used. So now he's printing those. So. Uh, Maine is ready for a surge should one come either now or I hope not, but next fall or winter. So that's what I've been doing in the lockdown. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, so just before the meeting, we were chatting about my favorite of Monica's books, which is Ernie's Ark. And we, and I immediately thought of her recently when, when that terrible explosion happened in Jay, Maine, because I, I was living in Farmington for many, many years, and obviously the whole of Western Maine really survives on the paper mills in Rumford and Jay mm -hmm. and in those areas. Um, so I love that book and I love the paper maker. Do you think you'll be doing anything more with those characters or doing anything more with paper mills? I, no, I won't be doing anything more with the characters. Um, but it's funny you should mention Ernie's Ark because it's, it's actually coming out again in a brand new edition from uh, David David Gadeen in Boston, uh, and it's got an extra story, one that was cut from the original, um, and a for and writing a forward to it because it's been 18 years since I wrote that book, and it's been, you know, it inspired my first play. It's been in a lot of uh, you know town community reads. It's, it's just had a very long history at this point. So uh, and the cover 
is so great. It's actually a beautiful kind of stylized photograph of the Rumford Mill. So you can see the river and the mill. It's so beautiful because I'm very happy with the cover. And it's coming out, I think, on Labor Day, which is quite appropriate for that book since it's about a labor strike. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny, I just heard today, uh, Papermaker has been done quite a few times in a few places, but I just heard from this um, theater company in Switzerland who wants to do uh, this, a German pr language premiere of the play, which is very cool. That so it's got scary. long legs. That book had long, uh, unexpectedly long legs, as they say. Yeah, and deservedly so. It's a great book. Thank you. Um, so I think we do have one question in the chat. Danny, mm -hmm. did you want to read that question or do you want me to do it? So I can do it. Uh, our first question is from Amy Curtis. She asks, Hi, Amy. Uh, could you talk a little about your process of writing? When do you write? How much do you write each day or week or whatever? Okay, well, you know, process is, as Amy knows very well, very hard to describe. Um, I am in my studio right now, which is separate from my house. And um, maybe I can just show you a little bit. Let, let me show you around. Um, <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna work, but let me take this out. All right, so this is my studio. So I have, you know, my things in here. I love chickens, so I have this, I don't know if you can see my chicken painting. And I have, this is a Nancy Parker painting that I love. Um, and this is my, you know, I just have things that I really love in here that are, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly small area, but it works really well. It's cozy. It's, I have a phone in here that's usually turned off and it's heated. My husband built this place for me and it's got, um, it has a, a six foot trench from the house to here, which is only, it's like maybe 20 feet. Um, and it's, so it's got this big, I don't know, like a culvert underneath and it, that's where the electricity and the heating comes in. So it's, it's all heated and electricity and phone. I have everything I need here. Um, and it's just a wonderful place to work. So as far as my, um, let me plug this mouse back in. As far as my process, my usual process is to just write about maybe 25, 50, 75 pages of something. This would be for a novel. And, uh, and then just throw it all away and start over again with what I know about the characters now. This one has been really, really different. I keep looking over here because it, it's right here. <laughs> So I also have, when I started writing plays, um, I discovered the joys of the three wing, ring binder. So now everything I write goes into binders. So this is, this is the draft I have right now. And uh, it's about uh, 250 pages or so. And it's not the end, but I, it's the first time I ever wrote anything just straight through without going back at all, at all. So, it's been kind of different, but the reason I could do it with this book is because it's also the first time the characters arrived pretty fully formed. And they came to me last summer in the middle of the night, uh, several nights running when I, I just really, I was actually really depressed last summer for a couple of different reasons. But um, so I was having this depression and I was very insomniac and I woke up in the middle of the night, nights on end with these monologues in my head. And I knew they were characters. I, and I knew they were novel characters and not play characters. And I remember literally saying out loud, go someplace else, find somebody else. I'm writing plays now, not novels. Um, and, but they didn't, they just kept going. So one night I got up in the middle of the night and I had a notebook and it was, Actually, I've got it here somewhere. This notebook right here, which now says notes for novel. Um, and I just started writing longhand, which I never ever do. Um, it's just not how I work at all, not how my writing brain works. It's always on the keyboard. And I started just writing down what they were saying. And I had three characters. One's name is Violet. She's 23. She's just gotten out of prison for vehicular manslaughter, which was a drunk driving accident in which an, a woman died. 
And then there's Harriet, who is a 60-ish year old retired English teacher who has been running a book club in the prison, and that's how she met Violet. And then the third character is Frank, who is a retired machinist who's working in a bookstore as a handyman, the same bookstore where Harriet comes to buy all her books for the book group in prison. And his wife is the person that Violet killed in the accident. And so the three of them come together in a funny little, I mean, this is always what I write about is families coming together out of weird broken parts. So that's what this one is about. And uh, so I wrote, until I couldn't really write anymore. I was stuck. I, I couldn't think like, what's going to happen next? And so now I'm back at the beginning, going through it, rewriting, adding some things, taking a lot of stuff out, uh, which kills me because this is also the first time I ever wrote by word count, which I never do. And I had, oh, 73,000 words. And now today I've done so much cutting. I have about 68,000, but it's okay. There's more where that came from. And that's just that's the process for this particular book, which is different from my normal process, which makes it fun. I'm gonna go to the grid view for a second. Um, yeah. So if anybody else has a question, you can either type it in the chat bar. You can find the chat bar by dragging your mouse down towards the bottom of your screen and a little window will show you a menu bar showing the chat. Or if you want, you can kind of raise your hand and flail at me and I can unmute you. I brought wine, by the way. I hope I'm not the only one. No, we've already established I've got cider. All right, well, cheers, everybody. <laughs> Mute this and wave your hand, maybe she can. Let's see, I hear somebody, somebody is. Sally, do you have a question? I do. All right. Uh, how about your How about your reading process? Now that you've talked about your writing process. Well, oh, my reading. I um, I've been reading a lot, as I think a lot of people have. On even though I've been kind of busy, I've I've been reading a lot. So I I used to be the kind of person who finished a book no matter what, because I was a good Catholic girl who you know did what I was supposed to do, and now I don't give a book any more than sometimes three pages. I mean, I, I just don't have time for this anymore. <laughs> so, but the last book I read, the, it was a longer book and I, it was highly recommended. It was called um, The Most Fun We Ever Had by Claire Lombardo. I don't know if anybody's read it. And, you know, the, the writing was great and every scene was so well done but I just didn't, I, I didn't like the family. It's, it's a big family dysfunction novel, which is kind of up my alley, but it wasn't one, but I, all, I slogged to the end of that one because I did kind of want to know, and it was one character, the crazy older sister that I was quite fond of. So I finished that. Um, but otherwise I don't, I will not finish books if I don't, if I'm not really captured by at least the writing. Um, the writing can, can take me through a story that might be otherwise a little dull. And a lots of times stories will start out dull and end up pretty interesting, so. And then after that, I went completely to the other side and I started reading and finished um, David Sedaris, Let's Explore Diabetes with Owls. And it's, I mean, he's, <laughs> it's really, he's a twisted little ghoul, but I love him. He's so funny. He always delivers the belly laughs for sure. Somebody else? Ann Wood, did you guys have a question? I have unmuted you so you can speak at your computer now. Oh, thank you. No, no, I'm uh, re I was really taken though by this new writing process. And uh, there's a gypsy process for this latest book. Yeah. Hi, Ann. This is my sister. I see her every night at Happy oh. Hour. <laughs> So we do have a question from Trudy Briggs in the chat. She wants to know what made you decide to write plays? Oh gosh, that was so much fun. I, I will write another play at some point because it's, it's so much fun. Oh my gosh. Um, I think what really did it for me was I have a relationship with Portland Stage Company because they, for years, they had a, this ongoing, programming called Longfellow's Shorts. And it was um, 
theatrical readings of excerpts from books by writers that they liked. So they had lots of people they did, um, not just local people, but other people who would come in as guests. It was really great. And so you had, you know, anywhere from four to eight actors on stage in front of music stands, and they would read scenes from uh, parts of short stories or scenes from novels, and they would take on the characters. So they would, somebody would be the narrator and somebody would, other, other people would deliver the dialogue. And it was a revelation to me and it was a lot of fun to hear my own work. The first one they did actually was Ernie's Ark, uh, which, which is ironic because that's the one that I did then turn into a play. Um, so it was, I think it was that experience that put the idea in my head and that, that would have been in the mid mid 2000s, you know, like 2005 or something. So it was a long time ago. Uh, but without that experience, I don't think it would have occurred to me to put any of my work into a play form. And then the second play I wrote wasn't based on an, a book or anything. It was called The Half Light. And they, Portland Stage debuted it last March. No, when was it? Oh gosh, I can't remember. Was it a year ago? I guess it was a year ago. Yeah, it's just about a year ago. And uh, time has no meaning anymore. Um, and that was a, also a wonderful experience, but it was a little harder to write because the paper maker is based on characters from Ernie's Ark. And when I started out, I knew those characters very well. I had spent lots of time with them. And with The Half Light, it was more like writing a novel. I, I was starting from scratch with uh, four characters who all had a kind of a complicated story arc that they had to converge at the end and you've only got, you know, a couple of hours and dialogue is your only, only tool, uh, which is both limiting and liberating. I don't know. It's a funny thing, but the thing about playwriting that is so much fun is hanging out with actors and being in the rehearsal room and rewriting on the fly and asking actors, could you try it this way or that way? Or at one point I remember, I think this was with, um, in Papermaker, and there were two characters, um, Ernie and his son, Jake, uh, who was new to this. He wasn't in the book. He was a different son in the book. Um, and it was two actors, Daniel Noel, who's a wonderful character actor, and this young actor from New York named Peter Albrink. And there was something about the scene just wasn't working, and I asked them, can you guys just start improvising? They were having a father-son kerfuffle, and I asked them to just start improvising, which they did because they're wonderful actors. And I'm writing things down and that's, I, a better scene came out of that. So on that same note, uh, can you elaborate on the difference between novel and play characters? And do or could any make the leap from one medium to the other? This question is from Nancy. Uh, making the leap, I think it would be harder to, to be a playwright and then start writing novels. But I think going the other way, if you've already written novels, you really understand how a scene works, that every scene has a beginning, a middle, and an end all by itself. And yet it has to somehow uh, build a little, even if it's the tiniest little step, but some bridge to the next scene. And that is so important in playwriting as well. And it's funny, you know, there's this whole uh, thing in the theater, there's a lot of stuff in the theater world, but one of them is this idea of a quote, well-made play, which um, in some, for some people means stodgy and traditional and old fashioned, uh, meaning it has a, a plot, you know, it has a beginning, a middle and an end, and it's not, um, you know, interpretive dance and light shows and things like that. And, you know, I like everything. I see a lot of theater and I see a lot of uh, experimental theater, avant-garde theater. But my favorite theater is story theater, you know, the old-fashioned, well-made play. I, I love it. So that's the kind of play that I like to write, which is not surprising since I write novels. Um, so it's, uh, on one hand, uh, it's kind of liberating in a way going from novel to play because you have um, kind of a secret weapon, which is the actors who are going to be saying the lines that you're writing. And what I've tried to do, mostly because I know, a, I just because I hang out with a lot of actors, even before I started this, I have some of my best friends are local actors. And um, 
I've learned a lot about acting from them. And so I leave room in the script for them to reimagine what it is. And sometimes it's the same thing. Like sometimes somebody will read a novel of mine and say something like, you know, I was so interested in that theme of parent, child, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Oh yeah, that was really great what I did. And it's, I didn't realize it until a reader tells me, and it's the same thing with an actor. An actor will interpret something in a way that I did not intend, but I realized was the intention anyway, even though I didn't understand what it was, that intention lived within those words somehow. And the actor is the one who found them. So um, it's, it, it is so, I can't even tell you how the joy of working with a team in that way. Because one thing I do not have in here, as much as I adore my studio and I like clicking away by myself for hours at a time, it is really nice to have a team. Everybody working for the same goal, which is to make something I've written as good as it can possibly be. So how is it different writing characters for a play versus a novel? Well, I think in a play, you don't have, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, in some ways it's not different at all. It's, um, you figure out who they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, you figure out what their problems are. You start out the same way. You start out with a, a person with a problem. That's, nobody wants to read anything or see anything about Mr. and Mrs. Happy living in Happyville because there's no story in that. So uh, in some ways, it's almost exactly the same. The thing that you don't have in a play, at least uh, without the actors, you know, play read on the stage, is you don't have access to their inner lives. In a novel, you can go on for pages about what a character is thinking. In a play, you have to somehow imply that in the dialogue, which is a lot harder than it sounds. So the, di the dialogue itself is so important because it has to suggest so much that can't be said you know it's all thought and sometimes just the actor's face or the way they but even things like lighting costuming it, that's what i mean about teamwork there's so much that happens to allow the, the essence of the story to come through to the audience and that's what i like a lot about that process so mary lou would like to know do you develop your characters sit and study them, listen to them at the table next to you at dinner, dream and then wake up and write? Well, sometimes I wish they would just kind of go away for a while and leave me alone. Uh, but yeah, they develop over time and, and over a lot of time. You know, I'm a slow writer. It takes me about four years to write a novel because I'm learning more and more. It's really like getting to know an actual person. You know, you make a new friend. Um, you know, some things about them right off, you might click right away, but it, it takes a while to truly know another human being. And that's exactly the same thing with creating a fictional human being. It takes a while to understand what they're doing. And a lot of times, you know, so much of this I think is, is unconscious. And sometimes I think of a novel as something that already exists somewhere in the universe, fully made, and it's up to the writer to render it properly as well as we can. Uh, so sometimes I will write a line um, and I don't really get what it means, but I, I leave it there anyway. And I realize maybe 70 pages later that it, it was something I just kind of almost knew about the character. And now 70 pages later, I know it for sure. And that's why that was in there. It's funny, there's little magical things that happen like that, which I love. Those are the moments writers live for. Claire is interested in your research. She'd like to know how much research you think you'll need to do for your new book and how much and uh, how you manage your research. Uh, this one actually um, has taken a lot of research, more than usual, because, well, yeah, more than, I think more than my normal books. Um, because I have two things. One is I have uh, Frank, my character, is a retired machinist. And even though my husband has done machine work, a lot of it, uh, I, and I, my father-in-law was a machinist. I just, you know, I don't know what it really feels like to be a machinist. And I haven't spent a lot of time in shops. 
So I asked uh, Dan, my husband, if he could hook me up over at SMCC. And I took, I didn't go every day, but once a week, I went to the machining class last fall. And uh, they were unbelievably kind and patient uh, with me. And it was me and 14, 20 year old guys. Uh, and I went on all the field trips. I went on one of the field trips. It was, it was kind of funny, actually, because we were touring this. Um, uh, there's a lot of small manufacturing going on in Maine, which I had no idea about. So we went and toured one of these places, and they were making, um, I don't even know what they call it, but the, these big, um, they look like a, a, accordion culverts for microwaves to go through and these are all done on this, these big machines and everything and so i'm looking over on the side and there's a guy who's in his everything is uh, computer controlled you know sh machine shops are actually very clean now you can eat off the floor in these places um, because everything is computer controlled and these, these big plexiglass um, domes over all of the inner workings so, but I saw this guy over in the corner who was working on a, a, you know, a hand machine. And I figured he had to be the tool maker, which is the person in a shop who, they're the really smarty pants guys. They figure out how to make jigs and fixtures um, so that whatever you're making on the machine is going to stay on the machine correctly. And it, it, this, this is really a, a lot of... Um, very fine measuring and all this stuff. So anyway, I go over to this guy and I said, and so here I am touring with all of my, you know, I mean, it looked ridiculous. And so I go over to this guy and I said, can I ask you a question? And he goes, uh, yeah, can I ask you a question? <laughs> I said, well, I'm not a machinist in training. I'm just, I'm a novelist, I'm doing some research. And I said, I'm pretty sure you're my character. So I took his, um, his email address. I haven't contacted him yet this was a couple of months ago too but i just i'm not at that place yet where i need to know what he knows uh but i will be and the other research i did oh my gosh this was so much fun um one of violet my little jail ex-con who's yeah just out of jail um she just got a job as a lab assistant for a behavioral scientist who is studying avian intelligence and he has four African gray parrots that talk and that he's doing cognitive experiments on. And this is actually a thing. I've been following the work of a person named Irene Pepperberg for decades. She had this very famous African gray parrot named Alex who um, could count and, uh, I mean, he was incredible. So, and she was always at the University of Arizona as far as I knew, and I thought, oh, would love to meet some parrots at least, you know, to, I don't even know what they weigh, you know, I've never held an African gray parrot. So I Googled her and it turned out she was at Harvard now. So I emailed her and, and I went down to her lab. This was two days before Christmas, I went down. I took the train down, went in and I met Griffin and Athena. And Griffin is 24 years old, super smart. They're doing all of these different experiments with him. The one they were doing when I was there is, um, it's a, uh, what do they call it when they do it with kids? It's, um, it's object permanence. And uh, also the idea of waiting for delayed gratification. So I don't know if you remember, there was this famous experiment with little children <clears throat> called the marshmallow experiment. And they had little kids in a room and they said, here's a nice big marshmallow. And I'm gonna go out of the room and if I come back and you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'm gonna give you three marshmallows. And you can see the kids like, you know, doing these things like carrying off their hair or some of them walk around the room and they try it and some eat the marshmallow instantly. So they're doing these with Griffin right now. And he really likes cranberries, that's the big treat. So they tell him, here's a cranberry. And when I come back in, if, you, if the cranberry is still here, I'm gonna give you three cranberries. Now, how, I mean, it's beyond belief. He can wait 15 minutes 
to get more cranberries. This is how smart this bird is. They have, they're so much smarter than we can imagine. So I went down and uh, Athena, she's nine and she's just a party girl and doesn't want to work at all. And she knows a lot of stuff, but she won't do it unless, you know, she wants to. Griffin will, he, he's the A plus guy. He really wants to get the answer right. So Athena just immediately, I walk in the room and what parrots will do if they want to get on you is they're, they're sitting on their little perch and they go like that with their foot. Oh, it's just amazing. So I walk in and she goes like this. And I thought, what? And he goes, oh, she wants to get on you. They said, but say shoulder, not arm, because she'll get on your arm. And we want, we're teaching her shoulder arm. So I said, I just walked up to her, I said shoulder. And she steps on my shoulder and stayed there the whole time. So I know now what it, oh, African gray weighs about a pound and they are very warm. So she kept, she would like go like this on my, she'd lean on my cheek. You know how when dogs like you, they'll lean on you. She leans on my cheek and it was a, it was a cold winter day and I had just come in from the cold and she was so warm and it turns out they're, they have a 104 degree resting temperature. So I learned all these things that I need to know just for the, like the ambience of it. And most of what I learned about African greys and about all those experiments and everything, uh, most of it I won't use in the book, but I needed to do all of that to have, feel like I had the authority to write a scene inside a lab where somebody is training African grey parrots. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> so our next question uh, doesn't have a name attached to their account, but they want to know of your plays and novels, which would be most easily adapted to movies? Oh my gosh. You know, I honestly don't think any of my books would make a good movie because, um, you know, usually in a movie there's one main character and almost everything I write has more than one central character. So that's one thing. And the other thing is almost everything I write goes back and forth in time which is also, I think, hard to film. So none of them is the answer, I guess. I mean, I'd be delighted, but I, d I just don't think that's in the cards for the kind of work I, write, I do. I don't know why. I hope I will be proven wrong someday. I mean, I've, I've had things optioned, but um, so has everybody, you know, and it never amounts to anything, so yeah. So Robert had a question tying back into writing novels versus plays, and they would like to know if uh, writing dialogue in a novel is the way their inner life is revealed in a play. Um, dialogue in a novel works pretty much the same way as it does in a play. What you want, a di one line of dialogue, what you it, it's, it's a heavy lift. You want it to do more than one thing. You want it to, illuminate something about the character. So it could be just the way they say it or what they're saying. And you also want it to move the plot forward, even a baby step. Um, you know, you could be very entertained having people sitting around a kitchen table. And believe me, I've written many of these scenes that got cut just because it's so enjoyable to listen to them talking. But if it's not advancing the story in any way, I just cut, oh, it killed me. I just cut like a page and a half today of a really funny dialogue sequence that I absolutely loved between Harriet and her niece. And um, I'm like, this is, this, why is this here? It's here because I was highly entertained by it and that's it. So that got the heave ho today. And it's, it's painful to do that, but it's necessary. Um, but I would say it has, dialogue has the same, exactly the same purpose in both a play or a novel. The thing in a novel is you can, you know, there's so much more you can do besides, uh, you know, the, the dialogue doesn't have to do all the heavy lifting because you can say, you know, so-and-so said such and such while thinking this, and you can't do that in a play. The actor has to imply it. I'm gonna go back to group view and see if anybody else has a question. If you wanna, like raise your hand so I can see. I've got two screens here, so it might take me a second to catch up to you. Well, I'm gonna have a sip of wine while I'm at it. Cheers, everybody. Oh, 
I had, I have to tell you something really funny. Um, when we were doing all of the, um, making all, all the starfish, uh, one thing we needed and were very short on, and everybody was short on, was uh, isopropyl alcohol. And so I put a, you know, a plea out on Facebook. And this lovely woman uh, from Yarmouth said, I've got some, I've got a, you know, a 32 ounce bottle of 99% uh, or whatever it was. I said, oh my gosh, I need alcohol. Just leave it on my porch. So what she left on my porch was a bottle of isopropyl alcohol and a beautiful uh, fruit forward Cabernet Sauvignon from uh, California. <laughs> I said, this woman really gets me. But Lisa would like to know if you have any idea when your new book might be published. Oh, no, uh, don't hold your breath. That's the answer. I don't know. I'm at, I, I just started it at the very, very end. Of, I think it was the last day in August. And for me to be on page 250 or wherever I am is kind of a miracle. Um, but now that I'm going through it again from the beginning, I'm realizing that uh, my idea that maybe this would be a lot faster than a usual book for me is probably just a dream, but we'll see. So Claire asks, or she, she says, you talked about the difference between plays and novels and how to move from one to the other. What about moving from short stories to novels? Oh my gosh. You know, most writers learn to write by writing short stories. Uh, and I used to love writing short stories. I, got, I can't remember the last time I wrote. I know the, the last time I wrote a short story, I wrote it for uh, my British publisher for the One in a Million Boy because they were doing some kind of a um, promotion or uh, anyway. So they wanted me to write a short story featuring one of the characters in the one in a million boy. And I thought, oh my God, I just, I just spent, you know, four years with these people. I really don't want to write a story, but I ended up writing a story about, there's this one line in the one in a million boy where Ona Vitkus, who's 104 years old, uh, mentions uh, having lost her license because her turncoat doctor wrote a letter to the DMV and uh and she had and one of the things she's doing in the book is trying to get her license back so i wrote uh, a short story about that about the day she gets her takes her driving test and it turned out to be kind of fun and it but it's sort of like uh it, those muscles were very weak it took me a while to do it just because i now i think i just think in bigger terms i guess um I think a short story would be far more comparable to a play than to a novel. Uh, it's a really different animal. You are kind of limited in your scope. It, not always, you know, there's exceptions to every single writing rule there is, but in general, when I have students writing short stories, one of the things I say over and over again is try compressing the time. You know, if it takes place over a year, See if you can write the same story that takes place within a week. Or if it's a week, see if it can happen over a weekend. Uh, because compression is the, the beauty of a short story. You know, it's a compressed form. And very often what's happening in the story happens over a compressed period of time. It's been a while. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the grid view. Um, if you would like to ask a question, you can either chat, type it in the chat bar, raise your hand, or if you know how, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I don't know your name, J-B-D-A-W, I'm sorry. You're all unmuted. It's Joan. Sorry, Joan, go ahead. Joan Dawson, yeah, and I know I've met Monica a number of times at the Graves Library, Monica. Hi. Penny Bunk Court, and also uh, at, your, at your plays, which I've seen all of your plays, so excellent. Oh, there you are, I see you now. It's, it's I can't tell oh, how are you? who's where, but that's nice. Right here, right here, yeah. I, I, was, I had a couple of things. One, do you have any 
idea what you will name this book that I'm now waiting for you to finish. <laughs> uh, the well, the working, being, go ahead. the working title is On the Outs, which is not going to be the title, I don't think. All right. On the All Outs right. is uh, kind of prison lingo for On the Outside. So it's, and I like it in a way because uh, Violet is on the outs. She's been inside and now she's out. But there's something about all the other characters who are going to be getting outside of something that they were in. So I like that. But the other thing that's wrong with the title is that um, on the outs also means, you know, you're having a fight with somebody. So exactly. it's not a good title. Exactly. And then the other title the I thought that... was Epitaph, which is um, just a bummer of a title. So I'm not really sure where, sure where I'm going. It'll come to me. Titles come very, very, very late to me. And when I get the title, I know I've got the book. Well, I love the theme because I volunteered at the women's prison as a mentor. And one of oh, the did women- Oh, you really? I did. And one of the women was in for vehicular homicide. Wow. And uh, it was one of those, there by the grace of God, go yes. I. Exactly. So it was, she was a good girl, but um, yes. it, so it, that interests me a lot. Um, and so I was, I, I just, as, as you were talking about that, I was getting very excited. But I, every time I've seen you, I've thought you are the most receptive person because oh, you, sort of, you sort of get the energy from all kinds of other people around you. And I love the fact that you let your characters develop themselves within you. So, um, oh, well, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it really, it, it really is. Um, a delight to even sit here and listen to you. Oh my gosh. That's so I guess that wasn't a question. I just wanted to tell her how great she is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is very sweet. I appreciate it. Yeah, good. Now, does anyone else have a question? I have to say that I totally agree with what the last person said. It was the first time that we've ever had a program where literally the next day somebody contacted me and said, do you think you could invite Monica Wood back? <laughs> <laughs> Aw, that's very sweet. So that's really neat. I, I have one, um, one final question, unless other people have more questions, but are there any characters that you want to revisit? I would really like to revisit Francine from Ernie's Ark. Um, when I last left her, she was an eighth grader, a misfit, uh, somebody who really, really wanted to be in the thick of things. And um, she's this kind of little outsider in a, a mill town that's having this terrible labor strike. And she's volunteering at the Union Hall. And her father is a jackass art professor. And so she's not part of this town at all she she di dying to be blue collar she's just she's a striver francine is a striver and i'm thinking she would be in her late 20s right now and i th i do think of her a lot i'm thinking she's probably in the helping profession somehow and i i think i'm possibly not done with her i think she may get a novel of her own if i live long enough <laughs> Thanks for asking, though. I, I'm very <laughs> fond of that character. Yeah. So and I, I, I think actually um, One in a Million Boy would make a great movie. I don't know if it, wave if you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Huh. Maybe. It's such a great book. You'd have to have such a good kid actor, and that's, that's hard. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. It is. So does anybody else have any other final questions? So we had a request in the chat that I've kind of been saving until the very end. Um, Robert would like to know if you would be willing to read a passage of one of your books to us. Oh my God. I could, let me read the opening um, paragraph of the new book. Um, I can't, it's got, it's got profanity in it already. Oh dear. Um, you, can, you can read profanity yeah. if it doesn't we're, we're, fine you. we're fine with profanity. We're fine with profanity. 
<laughs> okay, well, this is just how it opened. I, you know, probably won't open this way, but it's chapter one, Violet, and they all have their own chapters, and hers is the only one that is in the first person. I hope my sister's not still on here. Okay. One day in book club, we were reading this memoir about a woman whose low-life parents raised her in a crappy double-wide in South Texas, but they were secretly educated and talented, which most of us found ridiculous, not because of the mind-fucking parents, mother, hoarder, father, rapist, and not because the daughter forgave them, that's her problem, but because the daughter became a famous and successful cardiac surgeon after a childhood of eating dirt. I'm talking actual, literal dirt from the junky front yard. Dirt sprinkled on her Cheerios, a punishment for slamming the door in the summertime. I'm sorry, no. Nobody eats dirt for 16 years and somehow manages to become a famous and successful cardiac surgeon. And even if the story was real, which we severely doubted, the famous and successful cardiac surgeon's so-called tragic story was a joyride on a heaven cloud compared to some of the stories in here. That's, that's the first paragraph of my new book. Yay! <laughs> Which will probably not be in there. <laughs> but that's Violet. That's neat. Okay, well, is, if there's no other questions, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you all. I actually had to, you know, get dressed up a little. I put on some makeup. I combed my hair. It was kind of, you know, reminded I love your necklace. Of, I really appreciate yeah. that. I should have gotten dressed up. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Yes. And thanks everybody for coming. It was a wonderful chat. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Danielle, do you need anything off the chat? Uh, I have everything that we need, Deb. Thank you. Um, okay. I don't think I need to save any of the questions because I spoke them, said them. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting then. All right. Thanks so much for letting us borrow your Zoom account, Deb. We totally appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Glad it went well. See you soon. Bye. Bye.